Amen. As we can see today, the title today is The Ministry of the Holy Ghost, going from filled to filled with power. And uh, I've really been feeling on my heart lately that the Holy Spirit is speaking to me that it's uh, we need to kind of revitalize, we need to uh, refresh, we need to be reinvigorated by the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit and have a more of a deeper desire to know the Holy Spirit and to walk with the Holy Spirit's power. You know, these are the, the last days upon the earth and we can see evil is um, expounding at a incredible rate. And so we need to be the church, the people of God, that are walking in the likeness and the presence and the leading of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Bible tells us in Joel 2, 28, and let's look at that. Joel 2, 28 tells us, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters, they shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And I'd like for us to look here. The Bible tells us that he's going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. Let's look at that first word, pour, P-O-U-R. That is not a sprinkling. That is not a, a light dusting. That is not an occasional sip. That is not an, uh, a little bit of refreshment from time to time. No, the Bible tells us here that the Holy Spirit, that God desires to pour his spirit on all flesh. Now let's look at the next part of that, on all, A-L-L-L, -L -L, flesh. There's no distinction there on who receives the Holy Spirit. Men receive. Women receive, children receive, old people receive, young men receive, middle-aged people receive, all types of people that are hungry for the Lord, that are seeking Jesus in a deeper way, are available to receive this prophecy of Joel 2.28, that the Spirit of the Lord be poured on all flesh. You can say, I'm an all flesh, amen, all flesh flesh. That qualifies you. That's your category. That's uh, your, uh, your denomination, not denomination, your, uh, uh, your geography, your skin color, your age, your history, your background. Uh, none of that can disqualify you from this promise of God that you can receive a pouring out of the Holy Spirit and that's not just something that is meant for a short amount of time. No, that is something that is supposed to be continually happening as we're going to talk about more here. Let's continue on and we're gonna look now at Habakkuk 2.14. Some of you said Habakkuk, is that a script? Is that a Bible verse? Is that a chapter of the Bible? In fact, it is. I know we don't often go there, but let's look at Habakkuk 2.14, it says, for the earth will be filled, there's that word, that again, we have filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You know, and when we look at the ocean, when we look and, and think about the earth, you know, most of the earth is filled with water. As, water. as the waters covers the sea, there will be a day and a time coming in which the knowledge of the Lord, the presence of the Lord, the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth. And we aren't quite there yet. So I know Jesus probably isn't going to come back just yet. Uh, and as soon as I say that, I could be wrong because he could come back at any time and we'd receive that but we know that there are some things that have to yet happen before Jesus does return. And I believe that this prophecy has not yet happened. So why am I bringing these two scriptures up? Because the key 
or the goal for the church is to get to this scripture here, Habakkuk 2.14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the, covers the sea. Well, how do you think that's going to happen? What's the steps or the process that this scripture will come to pass? Do you think that this is just going to magically happen? Or is it going to be something that just uh, randomly happens over time and chance and space? No. The key to Habakkuk 2.14 is Joel 2.28 that we have already said here. When the spirit of the Lord is poured out on all flesh and people begin to prophesy and preach the word and speak of the word of God, then we will see a knowledge of the glory of the Lord fill the earth. So the, so this scripture is depending on the previous scripture. This scripture is depending on you and I being filled with the spirit of God and going out and doing the work of the ministry. Amen. So in these last days, in these final hours before Christ's return, we need to be about the business of the kingdom, which is filling the earth with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Amen. So let's take a look over the next four weeks or so, or maybe more, depending on how it goes. But we're going to be looking at the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we need to look deeper and further and make it more personalized for ourselves. You know, this church preaches a lot on the Holy Spirit. Kim and I have preached a lot on the Holy Spirit. Bishop preached a lot on the Holy Spirit. And in the in past days of the church, we've seen great moves of the Spirit of God. But I believe, I believe, I believe, and I am confident that the, the greater pouring out of the Spirit is yet to come. I believe that there's still greater crusades to happen. I believe that there's still greater uh, ministry of the Spirit of God in this church and through you. You know, the, the end time revival is not going to be coming through pockets of individual uh, great speakers of God. Of course, we need great leaders in the body of Christ, and I'm not speaking against that, but the move of the Spirit of God in the last days is going to come through you, you that are business people, you that are teachers, you that are uh, doing whatever it is that you do, that is your ministry place, that is where you're called to fulfill this scripture and fill the earth with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. Amen. So let's take, continue on and let's look here at Genesis 1 26. We're going to go back a little bit and look at some examples of the ministry of the Holy Spirit through time and then get into the meat of the, 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 the message today. Genesis 1 26 is actually one of the first, I believe, references to the Holy Spirit. And it says, God said, let us, plural, let us make man in plural, our image after plural, our likeness. So we see the, the beginning of the Holy Spirit's ministry here. And that was to be a part of creation, a part of crea creating men and women in the image and after the likeness of Jehovah God. Amen. So we can see here the beginnings of the Holy Spirit and his ministry. And then I'd like for us to take a look here at two different scriptures. I want to speak for just a minute about David. In Psalm 51, 11, David says here, do not banish me from your presence and don't take your who? Holy Spirit from me. Now, of course, David probably didn't have at that time the theology that we have now. Uh, the understanding of the Holy Spirit that we have now because Jesus and Paul had not yet come to teach and to preach about the Holy Spirit and the, and the person of the Holy Spirit. But I believe that David had a close relationship with the Holy Spirit. In fact, Mark 12, 36, Jesus is referencing back for David himself speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. 
So, they, so Jesus is telling us that the Holy Spirit was active. His ministry was active in the Old Testament saints and that David was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that David walked in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In fact, that's evident even in a different way. Every time you read the Psalms, many times when you read Psalms, you can really feel the presence of the Holy Spirit through his songs and through his songs and his, his anointed poems that he writes. You can feel the presence of the Holy Spirit, that you can see evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit in his life when he faces Goliath. And the Holy Spirit is not mentioned in that scripture, but the touch of the Spirit is all over and evident in those stories and in those accounts of the great works that David did. And so we can see that the Holy Spirit was used in the Old Testament on the saints of old for great and mighty works and to prophesy and to do these great things. And in fact, even as we move forward, we're going to look at the ministry of the Holy Spirit, even at the time and even just before the time of Jesus's birth. Let's look at the next slide here. We have Luke 167. Luke 167 says, then his father, being John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, was what? Filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy. So again, here, even before Jesus, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is working, moving things into position for Jesus's ministry. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave a prophecy. Luke 2.25 says, at that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him. So here again, we have another mention at the time of Jesus of someone that was filled or was baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was upon him. And again, Matthew 1.18 says, this is how Jesus, the Messiah, was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant. How? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. So I've shared all these to get us a little history, a little background, to help us see, to know, to understand that the Holy Spirit is active in the working of the saints. The Holy Spirit was active in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit was active at the time of Jesus, even before there was an understanding of the Holy Spirit, before Jesus explained the role of the Holy Spirit and taught us on that, the Holy Spirit was working in his saints and upon his saints. But Jesus is about to come and is about to change the order of things. Jesus is about to come and to initiate a new ministry of the Holy Spirit. So we can see not only is the Holy Spirit upon people, but they are filled, but the Holy Spirit fills people. And we're going to later see how not only can you be filled with the Spirit, but you also can be filled with the power of the Spirit. Let's continue here. And we're going to see a little bit more about the ministry of the spirit. Amen. You know, last few uh, weeks or the last month, we talked about the divine right of kings and how you and I under the kingship of Jesus have a divine right to rule and reign in this life. Well, this is going to help us understand that whole message even more and maybe kind of transition from this that message into this message of the Holy Spirit. So we know that as Jesus came into the earth, and let me turn my camera back on because I'm going to get away from the slides here for just a minute. We know that as Jesus came into the earth, he did not do any prophecies or any miracles by his own rights. You know, he had the divine right of kings by nature. He had the divine right of kings. He was a man on earth, but he was still 100% God. 
God. So if anybody could have done the work that Jesus did, it would have been Jesus through his own power, his own ability as God. But he had a bigger vision in mind. He had a bigger plan because he couldn't, as a man, he was uh, somewhat finite. He could only be in one place at one time. Of course, God is infinite and can be everywhere at one time, but it, Jesus as a man could only be in one place at one time. So he had to have a bigger plan. And so he needed, even though he had the divine rights, his natural divine rights as God to heal, to restore, to, to save and deliver, he needed the Holy Spirit to come upon him and to fill him in order to, one, demonstrate the filling and the baptism and the, uh, the power of the Spirit, and to, two, to show us that we, too, could operate in the same way that he operated in. So he's, he's, our ult he's always our ultimate teacher. He's always the one giving us the ultimate examples. Amen. And so we can learn from Jesus that this is the model. This is how you are filled with the Spirit. This is how you are filled with the Spirit's power. This is how you do the working of the ministry. And Jesus wants to duplicate his ministry on the earth through the church. Amen. In fact, John 1412, I don't have a slide for this one, actually, as I'm going to read it for us here. John 1412 tells us, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works. I'm going to say that again, same works as I have done, and even greater works, because I am going to be with the Father. So Jesus, Jesus had to go back to the Father in order to send the Spirit of God, in order to send the Holy Spirit to us, because he had the bigger vision, he had the bigger plan in order to duplicate his ministry on the earth through the church so that we would be able to do the same works as he, you know, because we are not God. We don't have a natural divine right as Jesus had. So we need that power source. We need that presence of the Spirit of God in us and on us in order to be initiated into the divine right of kings as Jesus was in order to do the work of the ministry. You know, the last four weeks we talked about having that divine right. Well, we need that Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the personal Holy Spirit to fill us and baptize us so that we can operate as Jesus could naturally operate. Amen. I hope that makes sense to you, that the Holy Spirit is our power source, is our guide, is the one that is there for us and in us so that we can do the work and do even greater works than Jesus. And what does that mean greater? Well, if all of us can act and operate like Jesus, then there's greater workings to be done. There's greater things that can happen on the earth in number, in multiplication. Amen. And so I'm preaching to myself, if no one else, because we need to be, we need to kick it up a notch. And that's, that's what I feel in my heart. We need to kick it up a notch. We need to get into the word. We need to pray in the spirit. We need to follow the leading of the spirit of God so that we can go to that next level. And that's what I want to talk to us about today. And I'm going to try my, I'm going to not try, but I'm going to do some of these things later on. As, a, as we need to get to that next level. Amen. So let's continue on here. And we got into Jesus, and he is preparing to start his ministry. He knows the plan. He knows that the Spirit of God needs to come, but he, he needs to first do his three-year ministry on the earth to teach, to teach and to preach and to share the kingdom of God and to share the the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and to model the ministry of the Holy Spirit for us. So let's go back to our slide here. And let's go to the next slide. And it says, uh, oh, I did have 
that. <laughs> Anyways, let's go to the next one then. Here we go. Matthew 3.11. Matthew 3.11. It says, and this is uh, John the Baptist talking here. And you can see in the picture there behind him, this is the artist rendition of that baptism. I don't think it looked anything like that, but it's a nice uh, painting nonetheless. But Matthew 3.11 and we have John beginning to teach us a little bit about the ministry of the Holy Spirit here as he's about to baptize Jesus. He says, I baptize with water those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone, Jesus, is coming, who soon, coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I am not worthy to even be his slave and carry his sandals. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So John is beginning to teach us here, even before Jesus starts his ministry, that there will be one who's coming, who is Jesus, and he's going to baptize us with the Holy Spirit and fire. Let's take a look here at that word fire. And I looked that up for us. It's actually the word, and I think it's pronounced poor. And this is where we get the word pure or purify. So one of the works of the Holy Spirit, one of the first works is to purify you, is to cleanse you. Amen. We know that the blood of Jesus covers us and, for, and he forgives us of all of our sins. The slate has been wiped free. We've been pardoned, but the Holy Spirit has a has a work that he does in us to help purify us with a fire, like a refiner's fire to, to get the impurities out of us so that we will be golden vessels, so that we will be pure vessels. So that's one work that we can see here of the Holy Spirit is to purify the saints of God so that we can be clean vessels for his ministry. Another part of fire here is kind of a uh, uh, suggestive or figurative language because fire uh, gives light. Fire gives light. And Jesus said, of course, we know the scripture that he told us that you, you and I, will be the light of the world. How can this be so? How are we supposed to be the light of the world? Well, one, we have Jesus in us, and we have Jesus in us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit baptizes us with fire, which brings light. And so we are supposed to be a light for Jesus through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, because we're supposed to be baptized with fire. The other point here about fire is that, especially during those times, and even today, fire is a force of power. Fire is a powerful uh, entity. And so fire here is an a allegorical uh, phrase or statement showing us that the Holy Spirit is going to come on us in a powerful way. And he, he, I'd like to say it in this way almost, that Jesus uh, wants to baptize you into fire power. Amen. I, I like that. And I'd like for us to think about it in that way. Jesus wants to do something for you because he's the one that's going to do the baptizing. We can't baptize ourselves in the Holy Spirit because we need Jesus first to baptize us. So I would like for you to kind of get a, a personal statement. You can get a, a personalized this message that Jesus wants to baptize me with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Amen. I want you to think about that. Put your name in there. Jesus wants to baptize Sean with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And I, I love doing these kind of personalized uh, statements because it makes it alive to you. It makes it real to you. It makes it, you know, you can just kind of see Jesus standing in front of you with a, a kind of like a bucket and ready. He's just going to dump because the Bible says pour. So he's going to pour the Holy Spirit all over you and in you. Amen. And baptize with 
fire. That's a gift that he wants to give to you. Amen. And we need that because how many of us, if, if we're real, if we're real with each other, how many of us feel at many times weak or intimidated or that we can't minister or evangelize to others? Or how many of us feel maybe that we've, we've been lost or are lost or alone or that we need some counseling, we need some comfort, sometimes we just need some help. And all of those are the roles and the responsibilities and the ministry of the Holy Spirit that, that I believe we'll be talking about over the next few weeks. But the first part that we need is that we need to be, before we can get to any of those other roles of the Spirit, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Amen. Let's go to the next slide here. The Holy Spirit is the cure for all the brokenness and frailty of the human condition. The Holy Spirit is the cure for all the brokenness and frailty of the human condition. Because if you think about all of the different titles and roles that the Holy Spirit is to play and is to do in our lives and does do in our lives, then he is there to be your comforter. He's there to be your counselor. He's there to be your helper. He's there to remind you of the words of Jesus. He's there to convict you of sin so that you don't fall into the traps of the enemy. He's there to give you power. He's there to give you anointing. Amen. The Holy Spirit is the cure for all, not some, but all the brokenness and frailty of the human condition. You know, Jesus, let's look at the next slide. Jesus is the initiating agent of transformation and salvation for our spirits. Our spirit, once it's saved, is instantly transformed, renewed, and made whole. The work of Jesus completes us on the inside. You know, your spirit man is actually the one that's in charge. Your spirit man, you, you know, that's why we got to renew our minds and get our flesh under control because the spirit man is the one that connects with the spirit of God. And so when we get saved, Jesus is the initiating agent of transformation and salvation for our spirits, but we still live with a soul and flesh. The Holy Spirit, coupled with the Word, transforms the mind and brings power and healing to the corruptness and weakness of the soul and flesh. You know, we, have, we live in a fallen society. We live in a dark world with evil all around us. In fact, the devil doesn't hardly have to hide anymore. He's out there. It's easy to see the work of the devil, which is why we as Christians need the Holy Spirit because we got to get our minds renewed. We got to get our flesh crucified and under control. So we need the Holy Spirit with the anointed word to transform our minds and to bring power and healing to the corruptness and the weakness of the soul and the flesh. I mean, because we have, we are three part being spirit, soul, and body, and we need all of those to operate under the anointing and power of the Spirit of God in order to be uh, successful in the ministry that God has given us. Amen. Let's look at the, I'm sorry, let's look at the next slide here, and let's continue with the ministry of Jesus and the model of Jesus uh, showing us the working of the Spirit. Mark 1.10, Mark 1.10 says, as Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. So Jesus goes to John the Baptist. He's baptized in the Jordan River. And you can see a picture here at the bottom. That dirty, muddy river is the Jordan River. And he is baptized into water by John. And when he comes 
out of that water, he sees the Holy Spirit descend on him in the form of a dove and it's, it lands on him. And then in Luke 4, 1, it tells us, then Jesus, full of the Spirit, returned from the Jordan River. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. So after he's baptized, he comes out of the water, the Spirit fills him and he's ready to start his ministry. But before he can start, he must do two things. And we can see that the Spirit of God leads him into the wilderness. So what's that wilderness look like? Well, there it is. That is the, the mountains, the desert there next to the Jordan River. It's very dry. It's very dusty. It's very hot. And I can just picture Jesus wandering throughout those mountains in that hot, dry, dusty wilderness. The Bible says it's a wilderness. And he is then fasting and praying during that time. And you know, it's during that time. And in fact, it's at the, it's at the end of this time that the devil comes to him. And isn't that the very character of the devil who comes and he tempts you when you're at your weakest moment. When you haven't been feeding on the word, when you haven't been uh, drinking of the living water, when you've had uh, two or three days without being in the Bible, then the devil will come and tempt you. Then he will come and suggest something to you. Then he will have you do this or say this to you or try to convince you of this or lie to you in this way. You know, so that's why it's important that we stay fed on the word of God. That's why it's important that we drink of the Holy Spirit, because if we do not, then we're going to be in a weak, weakened form, and it will be easy for the devil to tempt you in some manner. You know, and we know that Jesus, of course, spent 40 days. Now, I'm also going to suggest to you that if you're going to fast, you do not do a 40-day no food and water fast unless you are 1,000% positive that the Spirit of God told you to do that. Uh, there are many other great fasts that you can do uh, that, that don't require 40 days, no food, no water. But that's what the Spirit of God told him to do, led him to do, so that he would be weak. Well, why did he need to be that weak? Why did he need to have that uh, a weakened condition? Because his body at this point is literally dying. He has not had water or food for 40 days. His body is dying. It's, his body is craving and crying out for nourishment. So why did the Spirit of God have him be tested in this manner by the devil uh, at the end or at the weakest point of his life because the Holy Spirit, the, the Lord is showing us here that it's not by your strength that you're going to do the ministry. It's not by your strength that you're going to uh, build your business. It's not by your strength that you're going to uh, fulfill what God has called you to do. It's not your, by your strength that you're going to overcome the devil. It's not by your strength that you're going to overcome that temptation. No, because he's showing us through the teaching of Jesus here that his race is sufficient. He's showing us here that the leading and the filling of the spirit and the nourishment of the word of God is what's going to defeat the enemy. So many times we look at this scripture uh, and this passage of scripture and we say to ourselves, oh, what was the key to Jesus's victory here? What was the key to him overcoming the devil? And we often say, oh, well, clearly it's the word of God because that's what he used. He quoted the word to the devil and the devil left him alone. But what we forget to realize is that for 
uh, you know, for maybe who knows, 30, 30 some days before that, or could even, this could even lasted, you know, uh, in an hour's time, this maybe happened. We don't know, but for 40 days, he's been seeking God. He's been praying. He's been crucifying his flesh. Before it was literally crucified, it was crucified here. Before he had literally his flesh nailed to the cross, his flesh was being nailed to the cross in a spiritual sense here by giving up his fleshly needs and his fleshly desires to depend on God and to be following the Lord. Amen. And so we know that that fasting and prayer gave him strength. But even before that, if we just go back, we know that he was also what he was filled with the spirit of God. So there's two things at play here that help him overcome the devil in his weakest form, being filled with the spirit of God and fasting and prayer. So we can see how important it is to pray how important it is to be filled with the Spirit of God, how important it is to follow in the leading of the Lord through fasting. Let's continue on. Let me look here. That is what sustained Jesus in his weakest time. You know, it took the anointed word. Oftentimes we, we want to think, well, it's just the word alone. But no, it's the anointed word that saves the sick. It's the anointed word that brings deliverance. It's the anointed word that brings truth and revelation. It's not enough just to know the word by itself. It's You've got to have the word, the bread of life, and the, the living water. And that's what's going to get you through. That's what's going to give you victory. That's what's going to help you overcome the devil. That's what's going to help you have success in your ministry. So that's the that's the first point I'd like for us to to learn here is that we need both in order to overcome the enemy. Let's look at the next slide here. Luke 4:14. 4, and this is after his defeat of the enemy and the temptation of the enemy. Luke 4:14 4, tells us then Jesus returned to Galilee filled with the Holy Spirit's, there's another word there, power. Reports about him spread quickly throughout the whole region. So after this time of fasting, after this time of overcoming the enemy, now there's a new word added to the phrase. Before he went into the wilderness, he was filled with the Spirit. Coming out of the wilderness, he's filled with the Spirit's power. Let's look at that a little bit more. What was the change from being filled to filled with the Spirit's power? What was the change agent from just being filled to being filled with the Spirit's power? And I believe there's the key here is the thing that he went into the wilderness to do that we've been talking about, and that was fasting and prayer. So let's break that down a little bit. You know, fasting and prayer is the supercharger for your spirit. In fact, I think I got that on a slide here. Here we go. Fasting and prayer is like a supercharge to your spirit. When you crucify your flesh, you are giving, your, your flesh is getting weaker, but your spirit is getting stronger. And it's your spirit that, as I said, connects with the spirit of God. So when you pray, when you seek the Lord, when you follow Jesus, when you have times of devotion, when you worship God, and when you practice fasting, it's like a supercharge to your spirit. Being filled with the spirit is only the first step. Fasting and prayer is the next step to going from filled to filled with power. And I would also make this comparison here. And in fact, I heard the Lord say this to me when we were having our time of worship before the service. And he said, the first part is actually a uh, relationship with the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit is a having not just the Holy Spirit 
in you so that you can have power. The first, the key to having the power is to have that relationship with the spirit of God. As you, and that, that's what I was just saying, as you worship God, as you study your Bible, as you pray, as you fast, as you serve in the kingdom, that is building your relationship with God and the fruit of that relationship, the fruit of that fasting and prayer, the fruit of that seeking the Lord first is to then have the filling of the Spirit's power. The first fruit, there's two fruits then that come out of that relationship. The first of them is, is that you then have the ability to more easily overcome the devil. You know, the, the Bible tells us here in Isaiah 59, 19, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. So who is it that lifts up a standard? Do you lift up a standard? No, it says the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him, against the devil. So as you are fasting and praying, that, that's kind of like building that standard. That's making that wall bigger, 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 bigger. So when the devil comes in like a flood, and trust me, those, those three temptations that he brought against Jesus, that would have seemed like a flood to him because he tempted him to say, hey, if you're the son of God, make these stones into bread. And I imagine that was a powerful temptation for Jesus at that time. He offered, he offered him the kingdoms of the world. He said, I'll, I'll kind of fast track th things for you. You can have all of the kingdoms of the world back since they were first his to begin with. All you have to do is worship me. You know, all of these temptations were things that Jesus wanted. His flesh wanted bread. He wanted the kingdoms of the world to, 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 to be under him again, since at that time they were under the devil. But so all of these were like a flood coming after Jesus, coming at Jesus. But because he was filled and had a relationship with the Spirit of God, with the Holy Spirit, he was able to have a standard against the devil. He built up that, that, those 40 days. He was for 40 days building a standard against the enemy. Gives you a standard, a, a, a wall against the enemy. Amen. You know, and the second fruit out of this is we've kind of talked about it a little bit already. The second fruit to being filled with the Spirit of God and having that relationship with the Spirit of God and having that, and then having prayer and fasting coming into your life and seeking the Lord, then, then the next fruit is that you are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at the next slide. Yeah, the second fruit of prayer and fasting is that you move from just being filled with the Spirit to being filled with the Spirit's power. So the first fruit was that you are able to overcome the enemy and build up that standard against the enemy. The second fruit of prayer and fasting is that you move from one level, which is being filled with the Spirit, to being filled with the Spirit's power. And of course, we see this in Jesus and through Jesus's ministry as Jesus was filled with the Spirit of God. We've talked about how he operated in the Spirit of God so that he could show us how to operate and to do ministry through the Spirit of God. Let's continue on. And the Bible tells us in the book of Acts, it says, and I didn't write that down, but uh, that'd be good for you. You can go find it. Amen. And it says, and you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And this is another scripture proving to us here. If he did not need the Holy Spirit, it would have said, and you know that Jesus went around doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil because he was God. But it doesn't say that. It says, you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus, then 
Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. If he had done it in his own flesh, it would have said because he was God, he could do these things. But no, he needed the power of the Holy Spirit in order to model and demonstrate for us the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at the next slide. And this is uh, where Jesus uh, is handed the scrolls and he opens up the scroll to Isaiah where it says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll, he handed it back to the attendant and sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently, and he began by saying, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus is saying that he has been called to do all of these great things, but he's not called to do it because he is God. He's called to do it because the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And so Jesus, again, here in this scripture is modeling to us that we need, it is essential, it is important, it is powerful, it's not a it's not an extra thing. It's not like, oh, the main thing is salvation, which of course the main thing is salvation. And then you can have a few extra nice things here, like the filling of the spirit and the baptism of the spirit. No, it's, it is imperative that we receive the filling and the baptism and the fire of the Holy Spirit. Let's continue on here and look at this statement here. I've got written, it says, in the Old Testament, the saints of God had to wait for the Spirit's timing to be baptized with power. But Jesus was continually filled on choice, not by chance, each morning. You know, we, we read many, many stories in the Bible where the Spirit of God, Spirit of God would come on Samson or come on Elijah or come on David or come on this prophet or come on that prophet. And, uh, and then after that, the, the act or the, the, the ministry happened or the prophecy was given, then the Spirit of God departed from them. But Jesus is modeling to us here because he gets up every morning and he goes by himself and he has a time of prayer. And he's showing us that, hey, you don't have to wait for the Spirit of God to come to you. You can get the Spirit of God. You don't have to hope that by chance the outpouring of the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. He's saying, hey, look at me. Every morning I go and pray and I spend time with the Father. And every morning I am then filled by my choice, not by chance, by the Spirit of the Lord. Amen. Jesus, our teacher, is showing us that it's a new season. It's a new time. The Old Testament way of doing things is over because he's about to bring us into the new covenant. Through his blood, we have the new covenant through Jesus Christ. And because we are in the covenant under the blood, then there's a new operating system. And that new operating system says you don't have to just receive the Holy Spirit in small doses. No, it's like this picture here. There's a big bucket pouring into jars. It, and it's just a, a, you know, gallons and gallons and liters and liters of, of water being poured in here. And that's the way that it's for you and for I, because he doesn't hope for any of us just to receive a, a little dusting or sprinkling of the Holy Ghost. No, he wants to pour the Holy Ghost on you and on I. Amen. I'm in fact, I'm really feeling the Holy Spirit right now as I'm saying this. God desires, Jesus desires for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit and not just one filling, but every day, day in and day out. Amen. Let's look at our last scripture here for the day before we close. It says, 
So if you sinful people, and Jesus is talking here, so if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And many of you might say today, well, how do I receive the Holy Spirit? And in fact, there's a lot of false information on this out there and there's a lot of confusion on this out there and there's a lot of misunderstanding on this out there but i believe it's black and white i think this is in matthew well you can look it up on your own because it'd be good for you to look it up where jesus says that if you as sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children and your father who is good he will give so you don't have to beg, you don't have to pay, you don't have to sacrifice, you don't have to sow. It says the Heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit to who? To those who ask him. It's that simple. We don't have to overcomplicate it. We don't have to theologize it up. We don't have to uh, scratch our heads and, 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 and try to be a theologian on how to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's just simply those that are seeking God and that ask for the Holy Spirit. Amen. Look, we're going to close here and I want to pray for you. Let's stop the share. Amen. Turn on the camera. And I would like to say, and I, I know many of you and I, Possibly all of you have already received the Holy Spirit, but if you have not, today is your day by faith in Jesus' name. As we pray, if you have not received the filling of the Holy Spirit or the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the evidence of tongues, we'll talk on some of those things another time of, of tongues, and that's a, a sign of the Holy Spirit. But we're going to pray, and I'm going to pray over you. And if you have received the Holy Spirit, then praise God receive more today receive again have that refilling that jesus showed us that jesus modeled for us so let's pray today and if you want to receive the spirit of god if you want to receive a fresh baptism i know i'm not there to lay hands on you but we can stretch out our faith and there's no distance in prayer there's no distance in faith amen and i can connect with you are there our spirits are, are, are uh, eternal, and they can connect and they can communicate with each other. Amen. And that's not something weird. That's just, that's just how God made us. Amen. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And if you can pray in the spirit, go ahead and pray in the spirit right now. And then I'm going to pray in English and we're going to, we're going to have a refilling or maybe a first time filling of the spirit of God. Raise up your hands. We love you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Holy Spirit, Spirit of the living God, come and speak to us. Come and change us. Come and transform us. Come and make us new. Come and make us into the image of Jesus. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We invite you in. We just, as the Bible says, the Bible says that the Father who is good wants to give us the Holy Spirit. The Bible also tells us that Jesus came to baptize us in the Spirit and in fire. So right now, if you've not received 
the a first time baptism of the Holy Spirit, stretch up your hands and open your mouth. And by faith, just declare after me, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I ask for and I receive, believe I receive, I believe I receive the baptism and the filling of the Holy Spirit. And now I just want you to open your mouth and start praying in tongues, praying in the Spirit of God. Let it flow like water out of your belly. Don't stress over it. Don't try to put your flesh behind it or your mind behind it. Just relax and let the Spirit of God flow out of you. Wherever you're at, maybe you're in your home, maybe you're in your bedroom, maybe you're in your living room, on your phone or on a computer, receive the Holy Spirit. You're going to need the Holy Spirit. It's imperative that you have a deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit. I feel like in my heart, someone's receiving that, maybe even for the first time, or maybe receiving something stronger in them, a refilling, a refreshing of the Holy Spirit. In my heart, I feel that. If you're receiving that, why don't you send me a message on the in the, the message app on the Zoom here? If you've already been filled with the Spirit of God, let's just take this time now. I'm going to pray over you to have a refilling and a, and a deeper filling of the Holy Spirit. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice, just to walk closer with Jesus, to have a deeper uh, guidance and leading by the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost, I ask that you rebaptize and refill every day with a freshness of your anointing, your presence, your power over everyone in this meeting. In the name of Jesus, and I thank you, Lord, that even now there's a, just a wave of the Holy Ghost just pouring out over your people. And we thank you that there will be a, that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord would fill the earth through us, through us, through Anna, through your people, wherever we're at, whatever we're doing. We thank you that we would fill the knowledge of the Lord and the glory of the Lord in our place of business and our school with our families, with our children, in Jesus' name. We thank you for these things. We give you praise. We give you glory. I bless your people now in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Praise God. Well, you are dismissed. And if you'd like to speak with us, we'd love to uh, share with you and talk more with you. Amen. Amen. And I want to end the recording.